Uh, so welcome everybody, so glad that you are here, and I want to give a big shout out to the Storyline Church for letting the Lemert Asherick wedding completely invade and take over their space, amen? We, we, we are j- truly blessed, and we are so thankful for this lovely facility. Uh, it's my understanding that they've been here just for a short time. Storyline has been fairly nomadic, right? Is that true, to self to, uh, safe to say? So thank you so much for letting us kind of come in and invade your space. And when Ty asked me if I would speak, I said, yeah, I'd be delighted to speak. To be honest, I had forgotten, and my mind works this way a little bit, I had forgotten that everybody would be here for this. I thought it would be just kind of a small thing, normal storyline church. So, this, exactly. So this morning when I woke up, I was like, you know, the thing I was going to talk about, I don't think that's going to work very well. So then I changed my mind to another and then I was like, I don't think that'll work very well either. And I was asking Violetta's help. She wasn't very helpful this morning, actually. She's like, no, I don't think that's good either. I don't think that's good. So what I decided to do is just take all the best parts from about four presentations that I couldn't decide on. And some of you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Uh, so this is going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to go just through a very simple presentation on the nature of community, the nature of reality, the nature of love, and of God. Uh, one of the really awesome things that happens in a situation like a big wedding and happened last night is that people come together and they connect and they share and they laugh and they eat. And for me last night was, uh, we had a big meal last night, the uh, sort of Asherick Lemert tribe family, extended family. It was quite surreal because I think we sometimes operate under this sort of um, notion or maybe even it's an illusion that the people that we know all the people that we know know all the other people that we know, right? Because we're the common denominator, and so we sort of think to ourselves, well, well, of course they know one another because I know both of them. But last night it was so awesome to see people that I have known, say, for 15 or 20 years who have never met. And then they're meeting, and you start to see these connections, and it's almost like, you know, neur- neural. Like, it's almost like the way the brain works. You start making these new connections, and it was a beautiful thing last night. And it was, I think, a little foretaste of what heaven is going to be like, where meeting people are meeting people and then connections, and not just connections within a generation, of course, when all the righteous are raised, it will be connections, you know, throughout the whole of history. And it was just a bit of a foretaste of that last night. And then, of course, we're in the holiday season here, which is really exciting because the holidays are great. Who here loves the holidays? Yeah, I know that there are some kind of, you know, Grinches and Grouches, and if you're one of them, you know, no judgment, no judgment. But I, I, I love the holidays. We grew up uh, in, in our family, in our home. Uh, Christmas was always a very big deal. We would uh, get together. We would have stockings and, and food and gifts. And, and I've, I've just, I love the holiday season. And it's, it's really a time when even people that are irreligious or who are not particularly religious in any way, they, at least it's a time where we sort of give one another permission to collectively, at least in the West, we say, to, okay, this is a different kind of time. You, you kind of feel that, right? And I think that sometimes there's this sort of desire on the part of Christians to be, oh, Jesus is the reason for the season, and be a little bit judgmental. If, if people want to celebrate the things in life that matter most, we should, we should, uh, we should affirm that. Amen? And uh, this sort of, ah, you're late to the party thing, I don't think that's what's ideal. So I was thinking about this, reflecting on the nature of the holidays, the nature of the meeting last night, and of course the nature of the whole weekend, and it got me thinking about the nature of God and the nature of reality, and I want to talk about that this morning. And so I'm going to start by making a statement that is actually, I think, profound. I think it might be the single most profound thing that can be observed about the universe and about the scriptural picture of the universe, and that is that ultimate reality is, what does that say there? family-shaped. Now, what does that even mean? I'm going to try and unpack this idea here. We're going to go through a number of slides to that effect, but let's just start with Genesis chapter 1. Of course, this is the first book of the Bible, and it describes the sequential moving from chaos to increasing levels of order and of beauty through the seven days of creation, and then when we get to the sixth day of creation, which is, of course, the last day that material things were made, uh, the full creation doesn't end until the Sabbath, of course, which we're celebrating today, but we get this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let, and what's the word there? 
us, right? The pronoun is in the plural. Let us make man, that is to say humankind, in our image according to our likeness. Let them, notice all of the plural pronouns here, us, our, which is the plural possessive, our likeness, and then them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So in some significant sense, and scholars and others and theologians have debated, what exactly is the nature of the image-bearing capacity of humankind? And there are various ways to look at this, and there are a lot of really great truths that can be extracted from the image-bearing nature of human beings. But one thing that we can sort of just note at the outset here is that when humankind was created in the image of God, they were created as a family. They were created as a what word did I say, everyone? As a family, right? Because they were made male and female, each of them wonderfully, uniquely bearing the image of God. Masculinity, masculinity is, is image-bearing, and femininity is image-bearing. But the thing that God says to them that's really remarkable is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So they were not to remain just the two of them. They were not just to remain in a sort of coupled isolation. They were told to make a family. And so it has been observed by scholars and others that this familial sense is the larger sense in which human beings are image-bearing. And this is from a, a, a great work by Stanley Grenz, Foundation for Male and Female Relations. He says the image of God is primarily, a, what's that word? A relational concept. Now, we're going to spend some real significant time on this. Of course, this goes along with the wedding that's taking place tomorrow and the holiday season and all of the sort of community that's happening here. And Grenz makes a fascinating point. He says that when we talk about the image of God, let us make mankind in our image, he says that really what's on offer here is not just the physicality because there are many senses, again, in which we bear the image of God. God is moral. God is uh, volitional. God is uh, intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. We, we are bearing his image in all of those ways. But the point that Grenz makes, and I love this, is that the larger sense in which human beings bear the image of God is in relationality. The, the, the image of God is primarily a relational concept. Let's further unpack that. He says, ultimately, we do not reflect God's image on our own, but here again, in relationship. Thus, the imago Dei, which is to say the image of God, is not primarily what we are as individuals. Rather, it is present among humans in, third time now, relationship. And then he just sort of summarizes everything. He says, in a word, the image of God is found in human, and what's that word there? In human community. Now, this makes a lot of sense. If you hold up, for example, a, a mirror to your face, or, or let's say that somebody else is holding up a mirror to their face and you're looking into the mirror you know, at an angle and you're seeing the person, but you're not actually seeing the person, of course. What you're seeing is the image of the person. But now, this is the key point. The image that you're seeing in the mirror bears an identical resemblance to the actual person. Now, one of the features of God that we find throughout all of creation, and I would argue through the whole of Scripture, is that God delegates Wherever a task can be delegated, God leans into delegation. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's something that I've been saying for the last few years, that in the creation account, one thing that we see God doing, and again, I recognize it's a bit of an oversimplification, but I like it. I like the fact that it's a little more punchy this way, that in creation, God only does what only God can do. I'll say that again. In creation, God only does what only God can do. That is to say, if anything can be delegated to others, he delegates. And there are many examples of this in the creation account. One obvious one, an easy one, is that God gets Adam to name the animals. Well, this is entirely unnecessary, seemingly superfluous. God could have named the animals and then informed Adam as to what the names were. But he asks Adam to name the animals. Another one that we were just talking about here a moment ago in Genesis 1.26 is that God makes Adam and Eve to bear his image. Well, this is the supreme and most beautiful act of delegation because God already bears his image. Why does he need another image bearer? And then one that we just quoted a moment ago also from Genesis 1 is he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, God is obviously capable of filling the earth. In fact, many uh, Old Testament scholars have noted that the creation account is effectively God making spaces and filling spaces. He makes the space in the air, and then he makes the space in the water, then he makes the space in the land. Those are creation days one, two, and three. He then recapitulates those days in four, five, and six and fills the air, fills the water, and then fills the land. So you might say that in creation we are we are exposed to God, or God is revealed to us by Moses in Genesis 1, as being a, a God that makes and fills spaces. 
which is remarkable then, of course, on the Sabbath, he fills not a geographical or a geometrical space, but a chronological space with himself. But what's really cool about this is that God then says to them, be fruitful and multiply and what? Fill the earth. In other words, God is the great capital F filler of things, and then he invites us in his image to fill things. And so over and over again, we see that God is delegating whatever can be delegated, he delegates. And so back to that mirror illustration, if you're looking you know, at an angle at a mirror and you see your, your spouse's face or your son's face or your daughter's face or a friend's face in the mirror, no, the mirror image is not them, but it bears a striking, a striking resemblance to them. And the thing that bore the image of God, the mirror of Eden, was a family. Was it what, everyone? It was a family. And that's the point that Grenz is making, is the let them make, uh, let us make mankind in our image, let them. The us and the our and the them uh, is unambiguously plural. It's unambiguously a plurality. And so we have passages like, so we have passages like 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. We're going to come back to this passage at the very end. He who does not love does not know God for what? Say these three words with me. God is love. Now, it has been noted correctly that the text does not say merely that God is loving, right? Because loving would be an adjective describing a behavior or a series of behaviors or even characteristics. So you might say of David uh, that David is a loving father, and I think that's largely true. You might say that David is a loving husband. You could be described fairly as loving in your best moments. But no one would say that David is love or that Avidu is love or that Scott is love. So when, when we see this grammatical linguistic equivalence here, John is making a far more powerful and profound point than merely that God sometimes behave in a, behaves in a way that is loving. He says God is is, and not an adjective describing a behavior or a characteristic, but a noun describing God's essential nature. Do you see the difference? God is not merely loving. God is, what's the word? Love, which is fascinating because, and this is a little exercise that I've been doing over the last several years, we don't have any referent for God that we can be sure is accurate. And this is easily illustrated. If I say um, a lion, Okay, you can get a picture in your mind. You know what the lion looks like. We all have seen pictures of lions. Some of us have been fortunate enough to see a lion in real life. So we can see a lion, right? And your lion might look a little bit different than mine, but we know that a lion is a certain size, a certain shape, and has certain features or characteristics. If I say an elephant, right, we all see it. And we know that if we see an, an elephant, that's not a lion. If we see a lion, that's not an elephant. You, you can see it in your mind, am I right? And if I say a giraffe, can you see it in your mind's eye? Maybe you've seen that really funny meme that says, uh, it's, it's quite funny and I probably won't do it perfectly, but it says, you mean to tell me that a unicorn is a mythical creature, but a giraffe is real? Uh, a unicorn is just a horse with a horn, and a giraffe is a leopard horse with a 20-foot long neck. You know, the reality is funny this way, right? But the point is, is that we, we, we can picture a lion, we can picture an elephant, we can picture a giraffe, or anything that we have a referent for. Now watch this. I'm going to say another word here, and we'll see what your referent is. God. Now, I don't know what comes into your mind when we say God, or when I say God, but it is certainly wrong. It's wrong. It, 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 because we don't know. We know what a lion is, we know what a cheetah is, we know what a giraffe is, but when we talk about God in terms of his essential nature and what theologians call ontology, we don't know what kind of a being God is. And so this three-word, three-syllable phrase here is incredibly illuminating because it gives us some sense of the ontology or the nature of God. Not just who he is and how he behaves and how he acts and adjectives that would describe characteristics or behavior, but what God is. God is love. Three words, three syllables, and yet a universe of significance, beauty, and meaning beyond. So years ago, I read this incredible quotation from a well-known uh, evangelical theologian named Miller J. Erickson where he's tapping into this very idea, and he makes a profound point, slightly philosophical, but easily accessible, I think. Erickson observes, he says, if reality is fundamentally physical, then the most powerful, or then the primary force that is binding reality together is electromagnetic. We'll explain this in a moment. 
He says, if, however, reality is fundamentally, what's that word? Social, he says, and the most powerful constituting force would be that which binds persons together, namely love. Now, Erickson is making an amazing point here, and it's a point that I want to just dwell on momentarily. He's basically saying that we are presented with two sort of competing versions of reality, right? If we opt for the materialist view, the atheistic view, the non-theistic view of reality, we know there is something that is causing the universe to cohere, to stick together, to adhere. And he says, well, that would have to be some kind of electromagnetic force. Something is keeping the proton and the neutron stuck together. Something is keeping the electron from flying off into space. Something is causing everything to cohere. And he says, the, you know, the uh, best candidate here would be the various uh, forces, the, 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 the fundamental forces, electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, all of these forces that are keeping it all together. He says, however, there is an alternative view of reality. And that alternative view is that the most powerful constituting force is not merely electromagnetism keeping things together physically, but it is love that is binding the universe together, binding not only people together, but that God is behind everything, that reality is not fundamentally physical, reality is fundamentally social. And these are two very different and antithetical views of reality. Well, of course, the biblical view of reality is that God is fundamentally social, And this is what I mean when I begin by saying ultimate reality is family-shaped. It's shaped like the family. We might say it another way. Ultimate reality is covenant-shaped, that within the very nature of God, there is covenantal connection, covenantal commitment, and covenantal beauty. We, We this weekend, many of us are here to celebrate a covenantal relationship. Why are we here? We're here to celebrate something, that that Landon will make a promise to Saley, and Saley will respond and make a promise to Landon, and that in that connection and in that covenant, we believe that something significant, substantive, and dare I say, transcendent is taking place. We don't merely believe that this is uh, one group of molecules in motion and another group of discrete molecules in motion that are, you know, speaking somehow, whatever speaking is, whatever thoughts are, whatever consciousness is. No, we think that two beings are coming together that are voluntarily, lovingly, willingly entering into a commitment that bears the image of the internal commitment that God himself is and has. Something spectacular is happening this weekend, and something spectacular is happening in the world. We might say it like this. Not only is ultimate reality love-shaped and or covenant-shaped and family-shaped, ultimate reality is shaped like love. Now, there are a great number of lies on offer in the world today. You can take your pick. We live in the age of misinformation and disinformation and then counter mis and disinformation. But one of the great lies I think that's on offer today is the offer that the universe is vast and cold and indifferent to human beings. Uh, certainly it is vast and I suppose it might be cold in a temperature sense, but I deny the idea, I refute, I, I disagree vigorously with the idea that the universe is fundamentally indifferent to human beings. And I want to sort of make a case for that. Uh, this is a fellow by the name of Carl Sagan, a scientist, astronomer from yesteryear, fascinating guy, really an amazing fellow. And uh, he, there's a really a great little story. In 1972 or 1978, I think it was 1972 actually, NASA launched a probe Uh, into uh, space, it was called the Voyager 1. And uh, the Voyager 1 started taking lots and lots of pictures um, of the sort of solar system, of of our little neighborhood in the Milky Way, and then, of course, within the larger universe. Uh, Now, of course, we have far greater technology with the Hubble Space Telescope and then more recently the James Webb Space Telescope. The images now that we're getting of our solar system and of the the larger sort of galaxy and the universe beyond are astonishing. But the Voyager 1 was cutting-edge technology for itself, and it sort of did its about 10 years' worth of, you know, mostly useful, um, you know, picture-taking and and data-gathering. And then Carl Sagan proposed an idea to the NASA board, and the idea didn't really have any scientific value, and they admitted that it didn't have a lot of scientific value. But the the, the Voyager 1 probe was getting further and further and further away from Earth, um, just sort of drifting off into the empty cosmos, supposedly empty cosmos. And Sagan proposed that a picture be taken of Earth from the farthest possible distance that the Earth would still be visible. 
And uh, this went through some debating and how would they get it to the right position and could it actually be done. And eventually they took this amazing picture, it's become a famous picture now, and this is the picture. It doesn't look like much here, the resolution isn't particularly uh, amazing, but you can see, or maybe you can't even see if you're at the back of the room, but there's just the, the tiniest little dot here. It looks like a, almost like a, just a pixel. I'll circle it there in case you can't see it. This is a famous photograph now that has come to be known as the pale blue dot photograph. Uh, this image was taken in 1990, I think February 1 or 2 in 1990. It was taken by the Voyager 1, and it is taken from about 4 billion miles from Earth. Okay, now that seems like a lot to us, but you know, when you're speaking of the size of the universe and the size of uh, even our own galaxy and solar system, it's not terribly far away. But that's, that's, that's us right there, that tiny little bright pixel. And it, it's just ever so pale blue. Well, in response, uh, the, the picture was captured and Sagan was thrilled and others were thrilled. And Sagan went on to write a book actually called Pale Blue Dot. And this is the introduction to that book. Carl Sagan, who was not himself a believer of any stripe, uh, but he observed something really remarkable about the nature of this picture. He says, look again at that dot, and let's just spend a moment just looking back at that dot, sort of taking in the vastness, right? The alleged emptiness of not just our solar system and galaxy, but of the universe. Um, and maybe I'll just make one quick point before I read this, just one quick point, so that we understand how things that appear to be empty or vast might not actually be empty. And I'll just use the illustration that I was using earlier about the, the nuclear forces. So in a, in a given atom, we have a proton and a neutron that form the nucleus within an atom. And we'll take a very simple uh, molecule uh, with a single electron. Okay, we can have many more electrons, but just imagine the single electron. And, and if we just take this atom, which we've never exactly seen, though we've certainly seen evidence of it, if we just upscale it, so we're going to massively upscale an atom so that it can come into a, a range of, of relatability that we can grasp, we can get our hands on. So what we're going to do is we're going to upscale that proton and that neutron to the size of an apple. Right? So you can just imagine you have an apple in your hand, and that is the proton and the neutron. Okay, now just to give you a feel for how empty the world that we live in, the, the world of space is, the electron that is swirling around that proton and that neutron is roughly the size of a grain of sand. And its orbit is about a five mile diameter around the apple. Okay, that's what you're made of. That's what this building is made of. That's what all the things that are extended in space, material things are made of things that if we could zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in close enough, it would look empty, right? You have an apple with a grain of sand that's three miles that way, and then it's three miles that way, and then it's three miles that way, and then it's two miles that way, and then it's five miles that way. But by any observation, this would look incredibly empty. But if we zoom out, all of a sudden we have people sitting in a church on chairs with buildings and roofs, and it doesn't see, seem so empty. So, so take that sort of quantum view of reality, and then now make it a cosmic view of reality. Yes, it's true that the universe looks very empty, and that's the point that Sagan makes here. Look again at that dot, he says. That's here. There you are. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, aka Landon and Saley, every mother and father, every hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, Every, quote, supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. And then this is the great line, the most poetic of the lines. He says, on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. It's remarkable to think. He's saying the whole of human civilization, the aggregate of all of the, the poets and the preachers and the prophets and the warlords and the dictators and all of it, he says, happened on that little moat of dust, particle of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Well, the psalmist took in, insofar as it was possible for him to take it in, the vastness of the universe. And of course, without the Voyager 1 and without Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope, we can still 
assess the vastness of the universe to some limited degree. And this was the psalmist, quite, quite different than Sagan's observation. Here was the psalmist's observation of the starry heavens. He said, the heavens declare, Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. In other words, every day you can hear what the world around you is saying, the beautiful, vast, starry expanse. Night unto night reveals knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of us, knowledge of the world, knowledge of the God who made it all. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Ukrainian is understood and English is understood and all of the various Arabic languages and Semitic languages and all of the languages, Spanish and Portuguese, There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. This is a remarkable point that the psalmist is making. He's saying that we see in the vastness and the beauty and the unknown to him symmetry of the universe that there is something out there, something transcendent, something creative, something incredibly powerful. And Paul makes this point in one of the most remarkable passages, one of my, uh, probably my favorite book in the New Testament, one of my favorite chapters in that book, Romans chapter 1. Paul, there's an internal tension here to this verse that I've always appreciated and loved, and I want to just share it with you briefly. Paul is sort of waxing eloquent on the nature of of creation and of idolatry, and it's it's a great chapter. And he says, ever since the creation of the world, which is where we started, right, let us make man in our image, God's invisible qualities, and then he lets you know what he's talking about, his eternal power and his divine nature. Now watch this. This is fascinating. Here's the internal tension. Have been clearly seen, being understood uh, through the things that God has made so that human beings are without excuse. In other words, we cannot deny that there is a God and that he does exist, and there is some sense, no matter your language, which we have an access to God. Let me come back to that. Look at the tension here. He says, through creation... We can see the invisible God by his handiwork clearly. That's a remarkable thing to say, that something that is invisible is clearly seen. Something that is ubiquitous, that that surrounds us, is available to us, is accessible to us. Paul's point here is not merely that God is knowable in some abstract sense. He's not a theological abstraction, but that God is known. And this is actually the point that Paul makes, and it's a bit of a, a... maybe mildly controversial point, but I'll just sort of say it this way anyway. The biblical teaching is that no one, no one is in ignorance of God at the most basic level. This is why the Bible says, for example, and it seems like God is speaking in a pejorative, but he's not speaking in a pejorative. He's making a factual, sober statement through the psalmist in Psalm 14, verse 1, when he says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This is not God saying nanny, nanny, boo, boo, or calling names. What he's saying is, is that at the most basic, uh, to use a fancy word here, epistemological bedrock, that is to say how we know what we know, we all know that something is going on out there. It can be denied, but it can also be known. And Ty and I were talking about this just before I came up. We were in the other room eating, and I was saying, God has set the universe up so brilliantly that what is known and knowable and ubiquitous and beautiful can be plausibly denied. It's incredible. So that free will is preserved. No one is coerced or forced into believing what is absolutely not only known, but knowable by everybody. And that is that God is real, God is good, the universe was made to bear his image, and we are his sons and daughters. That is accessible knowledge, according to the psalmist, according to Paul, and according to Jesus, to everyone. And I was having this conversation with Ty on the way in, and I said, Ty, is there a better verse in the whole Bible than this verse right here? I mean, is there a better verse in the whole of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, than Matthew chapter 11, verse 19? The Son of Man came eating and drinking. What an astonishing thing, right? So, so let's just sort of enter into the Christian worldview here for a moment. For many of us, that'll be easy, but not for everybody, because we have visitors. Let's just enter into the Christian worldview, to the Christian claim, and and that is this in summary. Uh, God made the world, God is good, and then God in Christ came into the world. Okay, so the infinite, ineffable, eternal, illimitable God took on flesh and blood and came into the world. Okay, 
which then raises the question, if God is going to come into the world, which is a remarkable thing even just to think about, to, to sort of conceive of, whether or not you affirm it and believe it, it's a remarkable thing to think about, that God would come into the world that he himself had made, that he would take responsibility for the, for the frailty and the fallibility of his creation. But how about this? If God is going to come into the world, how will he come? How will he come? You can imagine a conversation between Jesus and his Father and the Spirit, and they're discussing what should be the modality? What should be the methodology? How should we come? And the idea is proposed, I've got it. I know just the thing. Let's go eating and drinking. That's just what's needed. What's needed is a shared meal. And what's remarkable is, especially in the Gospel of Luke, though certainly it occurs in Matthew, Mark, and John as well, scholars have noted that in the Gospel of Luke, the eating of meals plays a particularly significant role. That, that many of the most pivotal points in the Gospel of Luke, those, those, those important sort of inflection points in the Gospel of Luke, are happening at tables. People are eating meals together. And this is the point that Jesus is driving at here. When God came into the world, when he <laughs> shrunk down to an impossibly small size, however large God is, is it even meaningful to talk about God's size? But God shrinks down and becomes a human being, and he comes largely, primarily, by his own description of what he came to do. This is Jesus speaking. It's not, it's not somebody's observation about Jesus. Jesus said, the Son of Man, which is a Danielic term for the Messiah, came eating and drinking, and he says, look, the religious leaders didn't love it. They said, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. God came down and did basically what many of us did last night, ate together, sat together, passed the hummus, passed the baba ganoush, have you tried the bread, the dessert is delicious. Jesus again and again and again in Matthew and Mark and especially Luke, but also John, is described as being a person that shared meals with people for the purpose of relational connection. Uh, years ago, I read a, a fascinating long-form interview with the lead singer of U2, Bono, who is, uh, you know, a, a Christian of a stripe. He would certainly identify himself that way, and it was a fascinating interview. It was wide-ranging about their albums and their tours and all of this, but at one point in the interview, the uh, the question turned to religion, because Bono's lyrics, if you're familiar at all with the music of U2, there's all of these scriptural references, unambiguously scriptural references, and references to God and the divine and other things. And the, the question was put to him, what, what about Christianity in particular is interesting to you or attracts you? And he made a point that, that I had never heard articulated quite this way, and it would probably take a rock star or an artist to sort of make this observation. It might not be original with him, but it was the first time I'd ever heard it. And he said that, the, the scriptural teaching about Jesus' death is that he died on a cross, and uh, this is historically borne out. We don't know the exact shape of the cross, but you know, we sort of symbolize it like this. It could have been more like a T or more like an X. We don't know exactly, but you know, the Carthaginians and the, and the Persians and the Romans, they crucified people in a variety of ways, but this is the, this is the symbol that has stood the test of time. And, and Bono's drawing on this symbol, and what he says is, is that we have the, the, the vertical uh, beam, and then you have uh, what's the horizontal beam. It's actually called the antebellum, interestingly. interestingly. So he said, what, what we see in the cross is this, this convergence of the divine transcendence of God, that Jesus is the bridge between earth and between heaven and earth, that he came eating and drinking. But the, the horizontal beam is that he came to sit across the table, right, to sit down and to share the bread, to share the hummus, to eat a meal, and so in the, in the cross event, we see divine transcendence and connection and the verticality, but then we also see this horizon where he comes down, he's amongst us, he's with us, he's accessible to us. And if you read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I mean, Jesus is anything, he, it, he could be most probably best described in his availability, the accessibility, people can just approach Jesus. They can walk up to Jesus. Okay, you're just getting a picture. I've wondered if I was doing anything wrong there, Edgar. So, so this language here of the Son of Man came eating and drinking is to say that God came down. When, he, when he's going to reveal who he is, what does he come to do? He comes to make friends. He comes to sit with people, to talk with people, to listen to people, to heal people, to laugh with people, to eat with people, because God in his nature is relational. He is not an abstraction. I'm going to make a point here that I've never made before publicly. I've said it a few times privately, and I'm, 
I'm, I'm treading on some thin ice here, especially in this political climate, but I'm going to say it quickly. <laughs> the point is this. This is, this is a map here of the sort of Islamic conquest of the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. And uh, this will be familiar to you, of course, this is the Mediterranean, this is the north of Africa, this is Europe, and then into uh, Asia. And the, the point I want to make here is not a theological point. I don't know enough about Islam to make any theological points about Islam, but it is a methodological point and a historical point. One that I've reflected on many times before and I've heard, but I've just been thinking about, I actually shared it with Ty this morning on the way here. Um, let me just contrast that with this map here. So this is a map of the expansion of the Christian faith in the first three centuries, okay? And uh, so just to sort of orient you here, this is again the Mediterranean, here's Italy, and then here is you know, Jerusalem and sort of down here in the bottom right-hand corner, or we would say the you know, southeast corner. And, and you'll notice here that Christianity expands in the, fir- in the first three centuries largely to the north and the west. This is mostly under the influence of the Apostle Paul, but not just the Apostle Paul, others. That this is the direction that, that Christianity expanded. It went like this. Okay, now I just want you to compare that again to this. Now look at this map. Is there a difference? Well, there is a difference, and of course, we're living today in the shadow of this difference, right? Today, we talk about Christian Europe or the Christian West, and then we talk about the, the, you know, the, the Middle East as largely Islamic. These are like synonymous. This is the world that we grow up. The world that we grow up in today and that we know uh, is this world, where this is largely where Christianity went, and this is largely where Islam has went. Now, of course, Christianity's continued to expand into Africa and South America. But in these centuries, first, second, and third century, and then in the case of Islam, seventh, eighth, and ninth centuries, the, the point I want to make here, it's a very interesting methodological point, is that, is that you'll notice that the Christian map, here's Jerusalem, goes this way, to the north and the west. But the, the, at least in the early centuries, of course, now this makes sense because Islam begins in the Arabian Peninsula, but the main point I want to make here is not about the expansion into the north of Africa because both Christianity and uh, Islam were prevalent in the north of Africa. Of course, Islam was much later. But I want to talk about this. This is quite interesting here, the expansion to the east, into the Arabian Peninsula, Persia, and beyond. And the, the point I want to make here is quite an interesting one, and uh, apologies if you're not at all interested in history, but you notice that there's virtually no expansion this way in the Christian map. And the reason is, there's a variety of reasons, it's like so many things in history, multifactorial, but one of the main reasons is, is that the people that lived in Persia, the Arabian Peninsula, and beyond were not open to monotheism. Uh, Not particularly open, and they had their own sort of versions of monotheism, Zoroastrianism and other things, but there, there were, there, there was, this was not, the fish were not biting over here. We'll just say it that way. The fish were not biting over here. The fish were biting here. Right? And this is what we see in especially the ministry of Paul, right? all through modern Turkey and what he called Asia Minor, Galatia, even over into Greece, the north of Africa. Right? Paul didn't spend any time in the north of Africa that we know about. But we do know that Paul's big passion was to go to Spain. So, so even back then, with their sort of limited awareness of the wider world, they understood that the Mediterranean was a vast expanse. For example, when Jonah fled, he went to a place called Tarshish, which is way over here. So they knew about the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, so here's the the point I want to make. How is it that Islam was able to do in the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries what Christianity was unable to do? And the short answer is, and this isn't a disputed point, and it's not a pejorative point, it's a historically factual point, that that Islam was largely a religion of conquest. Uh, It's not denied, and it's not a pejorative point, it's just, that's just the way that it was. It was largely a religion of conquest, and where Christianity found that the fish just weren't biting over here, the Muslims came not only with Quran in hand, but with Quran and sword in hand. And so you began to have expansion when the message is essentially, you know, adhere to what we're telling you about Allah or your life will soon be over, then you had incredibly conversions. It was remarkable how that worked. But Christianity was not a religion of conquest. And now some historian could push back on that and say, well, actually it kind of was. Yes, that's true. In the medieval period, it did depart from the principles of Scripture of both Old and New Testaments and became a religion of conquest under the sort of uh, you know, papal apostasy, but it did not begin that way. In the early years, Christianity was a religion of proclamation. It was a religion of information and of fellowship and of eating and of teaching and of sitting down and sharing meals. This is well documented, and in the first three centuries prior to the conversion of Constantine in the early fourth century, Christianity spread wonderfully as information about God, 
as something to believe, as something to accept, as something to receive, and even more so, as something to live, as a lifestyle. Now, I want to make a final sort of philosophical point here, and then we'll wrap this up. If we cook the divine nature down, if we just distill the divine nature down, 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 we just get down to what God is in God's essence. And again, unlike a cheetah or a lion or a hippopotamus or an elephant, we don't know what God is, but we're just going to do our best insofar as it's possible to comprehend God. And if what we get when we, when we get God down to the most reductionistic thing, if he is singular, rigidly singular, well, then we are left with a God whose primary attribute and characteristic and identifying sort of feature would probably be his power or his sovereignty over the world. He starts making things, and he makes things by his power. He makes things by his sovereignty. And this would make sense then, if, if that's the way that we view God as a rigid singularity, as an absolute numerical singularity, that God's primary defining characteristic is power. He is powerful. But when we take the biblical view or the Christian view and we take down, we just, we just reduce God down insofar as it's possible for understanding, not that God can be reduced, but our understanding so we can grasp it. God is not a singularity. God is a family. He is a plurality. He is us. Let us make man in our image. God is love. And so now what happens is a very different, a very different result, methodological, intellectual result takes place. We see God not now as primarily defined by power and what he can impose on the world external to him, but God primarily as love who makes things that bear his image and the thing that he makes that bears his image are people and families and communities and connection. These are very different versions of reality, even though uh, both would be fairly described as monotheistic. Okay, I want to close with this point here. We, we mentioned 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. Let's just look at the larger context of that, and then I want to close with a kind of a funny illustration. So this is what John says. I'm just going to basically read this. John says, beloved, let us love one another. Can somebody say amen to that? Uh, let, let's love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I just got to dwell briefly on that point. This is the point. That anyone who has loved and been loved, which is everybody, knows at some fundamental level that God is not only knowable, he's known. God is real. He is the most ubiquitous reality in all the universe. But again, he can be plausibly denied. And I'm going to come to a really great point at the end. I think you'll like it. I hope you do. Verse 8, he who does not love does not know God for, say it with me, God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten son, God in the flesh, into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God. Oh, great, we do love God, that's wonderful, but our love is a mere reflection of his originating love to us. The big story is not our love for God, though many Christians tell the story that way. That's not the big story. The big story is that God loved the world. He didn't just love Christians. He didn't just love certain kinds of people, certain nationalities, certain races, certain, you know, economic. No, God loves the world. And the, the big story here is not that God, not that we love God, but that God loves us. That's what he's saying here. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins that God came in. And Lewis said of all the miracles that God, of all the miracles that God performed, the greatest miracle has to have been that God allowed himself to be influenced and affected by his creation. He was not aloof or indifferent to his creation. God came into the world, eating and drinking, I remind you. Uh, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Do you see the logic here? It's, it's unimpeachable logic. If God loved us, then that means everybody in this room is worthy of love. And if everybody in this room is worthy of divine love because they bear the image of God, then they're worthy of your love. It's really hard to hate somebody that bears the image of your God, your heavenly Father. Now, don't get me wrong. I am well aware of uh, the history of religion and how religion has been leveraged, uh, both Christianity and other religions, leveraged for purposes of violence. But it is, a, it is a bastardization and an inappropriate and illegitimate use of the Christian faith to hate someone or to hurt someone in the name of God. Can somebody say amen to that? I mean, just to state the obvious here, but it does need to be stated. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. That's the point we made about the hippopotamus and the elephant and the giraffe. We don't know what a God is. Watch this. 
If we love one another, God abides in us. We do see God, but where do we see him? We see him, imi- we see him imaged in human beings, the people that are in this room right now and all the people that are out of this room too. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, that we live in God. And he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. God has revealed to each and every one of us. He's not only knowable, he is known. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And I love this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Can somebody say amen? We love him because he first, what? Loved us. Okay, we're right down at the pointy end of the spear here. So to make our point, ultimate reality is family-shaped. Ultimate reality is love-shaped. Ultimate reality is like bird watching. <laughs> so let me, let me make my closing point. We'll see what you think of it. We'll see if you like it. In my view, God's love is like bird watching. I became a bird watcher with my wife the same year that we were married, 1999. We were in uh, Honduras on a mission trip and a friend there, um, Sean Brinegar, had a pair of binoculars. And uh, he was forever walking around with binoculars. And uh, this is, as I say, 25 years ago almost. Uh, And and always, you know, the binoculars would be up to his eyes and he would hear, ooh, ah, ooh, wow, look at that. So finally, you know, curiosity killed the cat. I'd say, what are you looking at? And he'd say, oh, I'm looking at a white-breasted croquette. And I'd say, what, what, what? He'd say, here, here it is. And he'd hand me the binoculars. Now, I do remember the very first bird I ever saw through binoculars was a magnificent frigate bird. Probably doesn't mean much to most of you here, but he said, oh, look, it's a magnificent frigate bird. And he said, look. And it just kind of looked like a, just like a bird, I guess, a bird. But then when I looked at the binoculars, I was like, wow. They're like magic. I mean, you, you, it was the most incredible. It looked like a pterodactyl. It was the most incredible thing with this great big red, what's called a gorget, and this long bill and these enormously long, frail wings. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then throughout the rest of that trip to Honduras, see, whenever he would have a bird that was reasonably stationary, he'd say, hey, do you want to see? And, I, and then I, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The, I was surrounded by beauty. And didn't know it until I had the lens with which to see it. So we got back to the United States and Violet and I bought some binoculars. And from 1999 to the present, we became birders. Okay, otherwise known as lunatics or <laughs> nerders. And I just want to show you a couple things. I've just recently become a- aware of the, the, the um, art of a guy named Greg Oakley. And I'm begging Violet to let me buy some of his artwork. But she's like, we can't afford that. I'm like, yeah, but I think we can, maybe. So, so this is a, this is a, I'm just going to show you a few of these. This is a pair of what are called golden-shouldered parrots. Just, just look at these. These exist in the wild. My, Violet and I have seen these. This is a double-eyed fig parrot, a pair of double-eyed fig parrots. Just look at them. They're tiny. They're, they're about, the size of, about the size of your thumb, actually. They're incredible. They fly so fast you can barely see them. Landon always gets a kick out of this one. Is this the one you get the kick out of, the double-eyed fig parrot? Yeah, he just thought that was the funniest thing. The dub- look at that. I mean, just look at that. That exists in the world. Oh, these are great. These are, call- these are called Western blue bonnets. They're a native uh, endemic parrot to Australia, and they live out in the outback. I mean, they're just astonishing. Okay, let's move away from Australia here. Look at this thing. Are you ready for this? This is called a Guinean toucanet. Look at that. That is real. That exists in the wild. You've all seen this, right? The keel-billed toucan. It's astonishing. Oh, this is a really great one. This bird is called a fiery-billed arasari. Just say that, fiery-billed arasari. Don't you want to see this thing? I mean, wouldn't you love to see this in the wild, a fiery-billed arasari? This is called an emerald toucanet. Look at it, it's amazing. And then I saved my favorite for last. Not my favorite bird, mind you, but my favorite of the paintings that Greg Oakley has done. This is called a black-billed mountain toucan. Look at this thing. What on earth? It, what? This thing exists in the world. And here's the point I want to make about bird watching. One of the things that happens to you when you become a birder, other than you become, you know, slightly maniacal and strange, and, is that you become aware, watch this, of a reality that's happening around everyone, but which the vast majority of people are indifferent to. You are literally surrounded by beauty. 
And when you become a bird watcher, you start learning things like the nature and time of migration. You start observing nesting behavior and you, you hear a call that's an early spring call that you know is a certain kind of call, which is different than the call in autumn and in fall. You, you start hearing things and seeing things and observing things that had been around you your whole life, but you never knew until you noticed it. But here's a remarkable thing about bird watching. Once you start seeing it, you can never unsee it. You are now a birder. And there are degrees of birders. You know, there are degrees of, you know, maniac and mania. But, but you, once you become tuned in to this reality that's around everybody, most of us just think that there are birds. No, 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 no. There are black-billed mountain toucans in the world. There are approximately 10,316 species of bird in the world. And they are all, in their own way, astonishingly beautiful. They're out there to be seen. But most people won't really see them or take notice of them unless it's maybe a bald eagle or something of interest or a chicken that they're getting ready to eat. <laughs> but the illustration is this. You are surrounded by beauty. Whether or not you notice it, you are surrounded by beauty. It is there. It is there to be seen. It is there to be observed. And you might be saying, is he suggesting and advising that we all become birders? Yes, I am, in fact. That's, that's only a secondary point that I'm making. The primary point that I'm making is that you are not just surrounded by love. You are loved. And once you see it, once you see and experience and discern the wonderful, incomprehensible, sometimes incommunicable, inimitable love of God, you can never go back. You seeing something that you cannot now unsee and to your astonishment, there will be people going about life and doing life completely oblivious to the thing that is most fundamental and foundational to you. And you look on in astonishment that people can't see what is right there in front of them. And friends, I just would urge you to, to be mindful of the fact that you are not just loved in some general sense or some you know, ethereal, abstract sense. No, you are loved. God knows you. God loves you. You are valued, you are important, and just like that beautiful black-billed mountain toucan, there's only one of you. You are irreplaceable. You are so special to God. You are so special. You are irreplaceable. Not even God could make another you as you. So your value is inestimable. It's incommunicable. And so you are not only loved in some general sense, surrounded by the unit. No, no, no. God loves you. God loves you. And this weekend, especially for those of us that are at Landon and Saley's, uh, in Landon and Saley's, Saley's wedding party, this is a celebration of very, a very specific kind of love. A romantic love, yes, but even more than that, a covenantal love. A love that reflects the very love that is intrinsic to the nature of God because God is love. Thanks, guys. <laughs>